Mm -hmm. Great to see you all. Yeah, if we had started off with a, a short video, it, it covers a lot of ground to the story and uh, that'll leave more time for our conversation. Perfect. So we'll just share that video right now. That morning was just a beautiful, serene morning. I had the windows down, thinking to myself, like literally thinking to myself, this is a beautiful morning. Life seemed, it was like, it was just great. I start to see squad cars flying by us. The squad car pulls up in front, and, like tapes it off real quick. Ask the police officer, like, sir, what's going on? And he's like, son, there's a shooting that happened at the temple. Police say the shooting began around 10.30 Sunday morning as many inside the Sikh temple were gathering for worship. Witnesses said the first shots came outside, inside mayhem. I felt anger. But then I felt this sense of relief that like I wasn't involved in that. I also felt this incredible sense of guilt. For the past five and a half years, I've continued to wrestle with those two feelings, survivor's guilt and survivor's relief. I am just appreciative to live this life, but I also have this guilt of I'm not doing enough. And you guys all hear that? When we breathe in suffering, and we breathe out healing. Serve so was founded in response to the August 5th, 2012 Sikh Temple shooting. It was a means for the Sikh community to transform this atrocity into something inspirational that would bring people together from that day forward. It was initially formed to bring about an awareness of the Sikh community, but then we knew that it was going to morph into something much bigger than that to really address communal healing for all communities. Today, Serve to Unite works with young people from second grade through college. We do arts driven service learning and global engagement. We also organize a 6K run every year to raise money for scholarships for six young people in honor of the six victims of the Sikh Temple shooting. And recently, Pardeep and I have started working with small towns and municipalities, trying to help them become comfortable with demographic change as, as populations are, are changing. We're weaving in our parts of ourselves into a map of Milwaukee to end the segregation, to bring everybody together. There's places where people are just not as unified and if we have a chance to change that, we should definitely do it. Especially with Milwaukee being like that, we should do as much as we can. So this is the bullet hole that was left by the shooter as he was trying to shoot into the women that were here. He was just shooting from back here. And then dad's final resting place was in this room, as was um, the other priest who was working. And he gets out here, <clears throat> and as these responding officers are coming to the scene, they engage in a firefight with Wade Page. And Wade Page takes his own life. <laughs> The shooter killed himself. There was not much explanation from law enforcement. So I said, uh, you know, let me reach out to Arno and, and really find out why white supremacists do these things. You know, in a selfish kind of way, I also wanted someone to raise their hand and say, you know what, I'm responsible for this. In 1987, me and a few friends of mine started a, a white power skinhead gang in Milwaukee. We started our own white power skinhead band also. And our band was very much a rallying point for like every pissed off white kid in Wisconsin. We must secure the existence of our race and the future of white children. We like stoked their anger and their angst and we blamed it on Jewish people, we blamed it on people of color, we blamed it on gay people. We later got involved in the early stages of what today is known as Hammerskin Nation and that's the largest organized white power skinhead group on the planet Earth. So nowadays when violence is perpetrated by this group, I feel a great deal of responsibility. And speaking of which, Wayne Michael Page, the man who murdered Pardeep's father and five other people, was a member of that group.
basically brought about an inner conversation where I'm saying, where do you get off thinking that you're going to go waltzing off into the sunset after all of the people you hurt, after all of the harm you've done? I left the movement in 1994. On paper, we couldn't have been more different, but when we sat down and talked, we saw how much we had in common, and it hit us at that point, like, we need to work together. we got to do something together to basically get this message out to the world, and the more people we can help understand this, the better off we're all going to be. Oh yeah, the murals. Um, we had a group of people who like painted murals um, on the walls in our school, and they had the positive messages and like things to bring the community together. Um, we've also been doing like art, we like to connect art. People of the high school age, you know, that they're the next generation, so it's important to me for them to have a good community for themselves, which will bring a better community for the younger generation and for generations to come. If we're gonna be the antidote for what's wrong with our society, we really gotta focus on what's right. In my experience, what's right is the truth that human beings have more in common than different. The more voice that a child has, the more vulnerabilities. So filling those voids with sort of wraparound programming, it takes a village to raise a child. And somehow, some way, we step back from that saying. But I think that saying is tr more true than now than ever. It takes a village to really nurture a child. To have amazing people in my life like Party Kalika, who have taught me so much and who love me and I love them. Pretty much every day I am literally in this state of joy and gratitude. That's what life's all about. So uh in a couple of weeks, we're going to be coming up on the eighth anniversary of the August 5th Sikh Temple shooting that we talked about in the video. Uh, Party, but I just did a talk last night on Zoom. Um, like all of you, we are now accomplished Zoom jockeys and everything happens here <laughs> instead of in person. <clears throat> Uh, pros and cons to that, it, it's, it sucks to not see people in person, but it's awesome to have this capability to join you guys from uh, the States uh, in real time. So I, I'm, I'm grateful to Eichnoth and uh, Sarah and everybody else for making this happen. And uh, grateful to all of you for uh, spending this time with me and listening to my story. Pardeep and I often talk about the moment we met <clears throat> and i think uh the the theme of the work you guys are doing today and thinking about bias is uh kind of a good lead into that when party and i met we were both pretty freaked out uh party's father had just been murdered by a guy from the gang that i had helped to start a couple months earlier. He reached out to me in October of 2012. And his wife and his mother and many of his friends, when they heard that he was coming to meet me, they're like, are you out of your mind? Like, you're going to meet a white supremacist? Nobody hears the former part. And I've, I've actually done this. I've done talks at, like, colleges where they'll do a promo poster. They have former, like, this big. And then below it, this big, it says white supremacist. And all people see is the white supremacist part. And, and I get that. I, it, white supremacy causes a massive amount of suffering in our society, and it has for 500 years. And that's why uh, the, the wounds are still so raw. And they, they certainly were for Pardeep's family. And they, they thought he was nuts. They, they said, you have post-traumatic stress disorder. You're doing crazy stuff. And party for a, he kind of agreed with him. He's like, maybe I am nuts, but I, I just feel the the need to reach out to this guy and to try to make some kind of sense out of what happened and something that there, you can't make sense out of. And and he wanted answers. He wanted to know how somebody could become so miserable that nothing but 
homicide followed by suicide seemed to make sense. And he also wanted accountability. I had done uh, a lot of media in the days following the shooting. It's very interesting to me also and, and heartbreaking to think that on August 5th, 2012, the Sikh Temple shooting at the time was the deadliest race-based hate crime mass murder committed by an affiliated white supremacist uh, in the United States since 1963 when the Ku Klux Klan killed four little girls with a bomb that was meant for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Birmingham, Alabama. Since August 5th, 2012, it, it just, it's humiliating and it's heartbreaking to say that the, the Sikh Temple shooting has been surpassed time and time again. And there, there have been so many attacks that uh, I, I, first of all, I don't want to leave anyone out, but you, you can't even name them all. It, 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 it you go from uh, the attack of Manuel AME in Charleston, South Carolina, the attack at the synagogue in Pittsburgh, uh, attack on uh, Latino people in El Paso, and then worldwide going to, to Christchurch. Uh, there's been attacks in Canada. And it, it's sadly proven that white nationalism is absolutely an international uh, terror movement. And it's something that we need to take very seriously. <clears throat> and and I, what, what I notice is, is after the Sikh Temple shooting, I, I went public with my story in uh, 2010 and in January on the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And so by 2012, I kind of had a platform as the former white supremacist guy. And I, I was slammed doing media after the, the Temple shooting like eight to 10 hours a day for almost that entire week. I did every bit of American media you can imagine. I did Australian radio and Norwegian newspapers and CNN and New York Times and LA Times, like all kinds of stuff. And nowadays when these shootings happen, it's just a blip. Like it, it, people don't even notice as much. It's just like, oh yeah, another, another mass shooting. Was it a, a pissed off white guy or a pissed off brown guy? Who it was? What was his problem? It's always a guy too. It's it's like there's certainly a, a gendered aspect to this. Uh, but I, I think as a society, we're just becoming numb to to the suffering that that's behind these shootings and and the suffering that the shootings cause. And I I think that's something we can't afford to do. We we really have to make sure that. Uh, we, we keep our hearts and minds open to the, the suffering that's happening and connect to it and uh, bear witness to it. And that, that's really step one to, to putting an end to it. So part of and I go to me and we're both freaked out. He's freaked out, obvious reasons. Uh, he's, we're actually made plans to meet at a restaurant and he asked me what restaurant we should go to. And if you guys are ever in Milwaukee, um, hit me up. And uh, the go-to restaurant is a place on the east side called Iisan. It's Thai Lao cuisine. Uh, I'm a huge local there. I've, I've been known to eat there five days a week. I, I no longer uh, drink alcohol, so uh, one of the ways I catch a buzz is through chili. And this place is like one of the most notoriously spicy uh, restaurants you're ever going to find. And so when Pardeep said, where should we meet him? Like, Let's go to Isan. And I later find out when Pardeep asked me, when I said that to him, he's like, Whew. and he, because he's thinking uh, white people in general don't like spicy food. And a white supremacist is certainly not going to suggest that, uh, that we have dinner at a Thai restaurant. So he, he felt a little relieved at, at my choice of restaurants. But when it came time to meet, he's like sitting outside the restaurant in his car and like freaking out. And he's having second thoughts and he's got little kids and he's about to text me and say, hey, bro, sorry, my kids are sick. And he'll you know, make up some kind of excuse and then bail. And uh, then he, he sees me walking past him. I didn't notice him parked there. 
and I'm a pretty big dude. I'm like six three and covered in tattoos. And it, this is October. And it's kind of twilight, and it, I got a hoodie on, and I'm kind of like walking down the street, like. <laughs> party sees me walking down the street he's like yeah skip this <laughs> i'm out here and, and he said there was just something that made him think like no i really i gotta do this i gotta go in there and talk to this guy and when he walks in the door i'm uh standing and talking to my two friends who work there and, and go figure they're asian and they're asian women and they're relative to me they're pretty tiny and he sees me sitting there talking to him, and he's like, oh, okay, that's reassuring also because he's talking to these tiny Asian women, and he didn't, like, eat them or anything. So that that's uh, another good sign. And I'm freaked out because when Party reached out to me, I was simultaneously really grateful for this opportunity to meet him and to, to serve him and his family and his community. And and incredibly honored that he, he reached out to me. And at the same time, I was really intimidated. I'm like, what can I say to this guy that's going to remotely be enough? That I couldn't, you know, like, hey, I'm Arno. Sorry about your dad. Like, it, it just anything I, I could think of just seemed hollow and insufficient. And so I, I, I felt like I wasn't enough and I, I couldn't do enough to, to even begin to let him know how sorry I was that this happened and uh, that I wish I could take it all back. And so I'm freaked out about what I'm going to say to him. And as he comes in, the first thing I notice is he's got a piece of tape above his eye like this. And uh, part of him, he, he, his whole life he's been a jock. He's he played football, baseball, basketball. He's pretty buff. And so he, he comes walking in the door. He's got this tape above his eye. And the first thing I think is he looks like an MMA fighter. And and so just kind of like stunned by that tape rather than say like, hey, I'm Arno. Sorry about your dad. I'm just like, dude, what happened to your eye? Did you get in a brawl or something? And he goes on to tell me that the week earlier – He's uh, bathing his young son and daughter while his mom, his, his wife's at work. His son's four, his daughter's seven. And his daughter is just getting to this age in a kid's life where they're starting to get self-conscious about being naked. And she's like, Dad, don't look at me when you're giving me a bath. And he's like, okay, well, it's kind of hard to do. I, so and I'm, I'm a daughter as well. And then fathers, you're going to do whatever your daughter asks. Even if it's impossible, you'll find a way to do it. So Partip's looking away from his daughter as he's scrubbing her down. But he has to keep peeking over there to make sure he's getting everywhere. Because if he, she's not clean, his wife's going to know and she's going to be angry. And so he's looking away, scrub, 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 peek, looking away, scrub, scrub, scrub. And he goes to look away, and in the corner of the bathtub, he's got one of these shower organizer things. It's on like a spring between the tub and the ceiling. It's got little shelves for shampoo and stuff. And hanging off the shelves are these hooks where you'd like hang a loofah or something. And his wife for a long time was like, party, you got to get rid of those hooks. Somebody's going to lose an eye. And, and like many husbands, party was like, yeah, oh, sure, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. He never got to it, because, except for now, because as he's looking away, this hook goes into his eye like a hot knife through butter, like through the white of his eye and then up and out of, above his eyebrow like a fish hook. And he's like stuck to this thing, and he, he's, he pulls the springs, and he kind of like sits up like this, and he's holding it, and he's like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? And his daughter starts screaming, and she grabs on the hook and she's yanking on it, thinking she's trying to help daddy when actually he can feel his eyeball like pulling out of its socket as he's trying to stop her from pulling it. And fortunately, Partip's a, a former cop and, and he's pretty cool under pressure. So he's like, baby girl, let go of the hook. You got to let go of the hook. And, and she lets go and he goes up to the mirror and he like takes it out and blood goes flying everywhere and he's, takes a towel and he's holding it over his eye and he's like, okay, kids, get dressed. We're going to go to the emergency room. And so he is simultaneously juggling the phone, calling his wife, holding his eye, picking up his younger son, his daughter's on his arm. He gets on the phone. He's like, honey, um, you know that hook in the bathroom? 
you're going to say I told you so. Uh, <laughs> he tells her what happens, and she's like, you idiot. And uh, he comes walking into this urgent care, like a, two blocks away from his house, and they're like, nope, emergency room, can't help you. Just as they're trying to sort out an ambulance, his wife gets there, takes him to the real doctor, and they look at his eye, and, and the doctor's like, Party, you are one of the luckiest people I've ever met. And Party's like, oh, really? Because I, I don't feel very lucky. And uh, the doctor's like, if that thing would have been two millimeters the other way, you'd have a glass eye. But as it is, uh, it, you know, your eye's going to be okay. It's going to heal. But what that hook did was tear the muscle that operated his upper eyelid. And in true Punjabi fabulousness, uh, <laughs> just, to, just to get the job done, he had a piece of tape to hold his eyelid up so he could see. But the problem was, was that his eye would dry out, so he had to like manually blink it like this every once in a while. And he tells me this story just as I just told you. And just as you guys were, I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm like wincing as he's describing this ridiculous accident and uh, literally feeling the pain that he went through. And beyond that, I am far and away my own worst enemy. I, I am a ridiculous, almost fatal klutz to the point, and I keep proving this. And, and my latest thing is a week ago, I broke my foot stepping up on a sidewalk from a curb on the street. Bizarre flip-flop accident. Um, <laughs> Like, that's how klutzy I am. So when Party tells me the story, I'm like, this is my guy. Like, this, we were separated at birth. This is, uh, I'm the only other human being on earth who's this klutzy. And that moment of empathy, like, set the stage for our friendship. And, and if we're talking about bias, like, we both walked into this interaction heaping with bias and, and heaping with preconceptions and misconceptions about who each other was and what this guy was about and what's going to happen here. And thanks to this like ridiculous freak bathtub accident, loofah hook <laughs> incident. Uh, the, and this story that party tells me, which by the way is our favorite story to tell, like everything that we do is just to develop operations, uh, opportunities to tell this story. When I, I was like, Hey, can you speak? Uh, to her conference at 6 a.m. your time, and I'm like, yeah, I guess I can tell the story like that. That'll make it worth it. So thank you guys for listening to that story. And, um, it, and it's 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 a, you know as you can see, it's it's a really good way to talk about bias and and how to get through it. Empathy is is such a powerful thing, and when we can put ourselves in someone else's shoes and see ourselves in them and see them and us, that to me is, is the answer to bias. And when, when you start at that point, and you, you start from within, and uh, you change the way that, that you look at things, that's how you really begin to change the world. Uh, I, I have, I'm very fortunate to have amazing friends from all around the world, including you guys now. And as the video mentioned in our Serve to Unite program, we have something called Global Mentors. And the Global Mentors are, are former violent extremists or survivors of violent extremists, like party, violent extremism, like party from all over the world. And one of my, my friends is a guy named Basama Rahman. He's a Palestinian man whose daughter, Abir, was uh, killed by an Israeli soldier who was blasting rubber bullets into a crowd of kids. And I met Bassam with my friend Robbie, who's a Pal uh, an Israeli woman whose son David was killed by a Palestinian sniper. And Bassam has a favorite saying by Rumi, which uh, I, I just uh, was refreshed on in his book. And the saying is, uh, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. And today I'm wise, so I'm changing myself. And I, I think that's such a powerful thing to keep front and center. Like, because that's the only thing you can change is, is how you relate to the world and how you relate to other people. 
And it, at first it can seem like you're powerless because that's all you have control of, but it's actually, a, it's, it's incredibly powerful because we relate to the world through stories. Every single one of us do. And um, I, the other day on Facebook, I, I just, I'm thinking about this and I just posted, I say, uh, I'm not trying to change the way you think. I'm just trying to get you to understand that you are the, the author of the story that you relate to the world through. And a lot of people go, oh, that's brilliant, yay. And, and then one guy I know I went to high school with, who I, it was very, very hyper-politically polarized. I, I'm not even gonna say which political poll because it doesn't matter. But once you get to the extremes, it's the exact same thought process. And he goes there and he's like, well, I don't relate to the world through stories. I relate to the world through facts. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, the fact that you think your story is the lone one based on objective truth and everybody else relates to the world through stories, that, that's a story in itself. And, and you're really actually proving my point. So it, I, I think it's a really exciting thing to understand that you relate to the world through a story. And when you are the author of that story, you're literally the author of your reality. And if that sounds kind of far out, I, I can just very simply show you how it works. When I was a white nationalist, I believed a story that told me that the color of my skin made me superior to everyone else to the point where I believed white people could dominate the entire world. I believe the color of my skin made me better than everyone else, different than everybody else. I believe that my racial identity was not just the most important factor, but the lone factor of my identity, and that that went for everybody else as well. I believe that there were white people and there was everybody else. That was the story that I believed in, and for seven years, it shaped my relationship with the world. During that seven-year period, two friends of mine were killed in street fights. I lost count of how many friends were incarcerated. I attempted suicide twice by slitting my wrists. Uh, it could be argued that the whole seven year period was an ongoing suicide attempt. And that was all because I made the conscious choice to believe in that story. Today, the story I believe is that human beings have far more alike than different. And that this experience that we all co-create each moment is a primally good thing that we can always be grateful for. And that story defines my relationship with the world today. And um, haven't committed suicide in a good long time. Uh, I, I travel, literally travel the, the world up until the pandemic hit. And not traveling has been about the hardest part for me. But uh, in any case, even not traveling now, everywhere I go, everyone I see, I, I see my family. I see my fellow human beings. And, and it's up to me to, to believe in that story. And that goes a long way also to addressing uh, subconscious bias that we have from our personal experiences and also from karma of society for uh, 200,000 years shaping the way that we look at each other and see each other. So that's my... I, Again, if you guys forgive me if I'm rambling a bit, but I, I'm not a morning person and typically not up at 6 a.m., so I'm a little <laughs> slap happy. But uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Um, no questions are off limits. I appreciate difficult questions, and I, I get especially uh, happy when I get a question that I've never had before. So bring them on. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, we have some questions in the chat. Um, let's start from here. Why nationalism tend to spike during economic crisis? During the current coronavirus, are you getting signs of this, or what signs would you look for? Yeah, we. This is uh, absolutely perfect storm for uh, widespread white nationalism and. As I say that, I, I always make the point that, uh, again, being conscious of these stories. When I was a white nationalist myself, I was basically like, I hate everyone and the world hates me. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. So I, I say that just to be very, very 
wary of self-fulfilling prophecy. If uh, we, we keep repeating our, to ourselves like a mantra, like the white nationals are coming to get us. White nationals are everywhere. They're hiding under every rock. They're around every corner. Like th that's, that's a good way to actually bring that scenario about when it, it may not actually be the case. But that being said, yeah, um, economic difficulties, um, any kind of difficulty that's happening in society, white nationalists, along with every other form of violent extremists, uh, are there to prey upon the, the suffering that people are going through. And that's because suffering is a prerequisite to violent extremism. Very simply, if you're happy and well-adjusted, you, you, you're pretty much like inoculated against violent extremism. You've got no reason to hate people and no reason to hurt people. But when life is really difficult and you're struggling and you're suffering and somebody comes along and says, you know why life's difficult? Because of them. They're the ones who are, are threatening you. They're the ones who have to go. It, it's, it, as human beings, tribalism is something that we're susceptible to. It goes back to our, our earliest forms of social organizing. So, again, the answer is uh, your story. Wh who is your tribe? Y you define that. Yeah, society has a big role, but ultimately each one of us makes the decision of who our tribe is. And as I mentioned, uh, today I, you're all my tribe. Everybody is my tribe. I make that decision. Um, Wakanda forever. <laughs> <laughs> hidden, yeah. hidden scene number two in Black Panther when T'Challa says, we are all one tribe. Like, that's, that's up to us. And, and so I, I think that's really important to keep front and center as, as we are indeed in a time that's ripe for white nationalism and all other forms of violent extremism. That's amazing. Thank you, Arno. Um, the other questions that are related for Gaurung and Robert together is... Oh, Robert and Gaia. Oh, Robert and Gaia together is sort of, what made you leave the hate group in the first place? What was it that broke the delusion for you um, in the first place? What, what brought me to change the course of my life was compassion, kindness, and forgiveness. Uh, it, it wasn't violence. I, I wallowed in violence back then. Violence was my bread and butter, and everything I did was meant to provoke it. Uh, if, if I could get someone so angry with me that they were ready to swing at me, that was my objective. That, that was exactly where I wanted to be. And while I'm a big, gnarly dude, I, I'm very uncoordinated, and I got beat up as often as I beat other people up. And in no situation did violence ever make me one less, one bit less violent. Um, that's, that's a reason why I'm very outspoken against uh, violent Antifa nowadays, because they're, they're not helping anything. They're, they're giving uh, white nationalists and fascist groups exactly what they want. And uh, I don't want to see that happen. So violence didn't change the way that I looked at the world. What changed the way that I looked at the world was very brave people that I claimed to hate. People like a Jewish boss, a lesbian supervisor, black and Latino co-workers who refused to capitulate to my hostility and reflect it as I was trying to provoke. And instead, they dictated the rules of engagement to me. I, I work with a lot of veterans of the U.S. military. They're, they're a particularly at-risk group for white nationalists. And every single one of them uh, is coming out thinking like in military terms. And so I, to reach them, I got to think tactically as well. I was never in the military officially. I was definitely like a paramilitary back in the day. I did a lot of crawling through bushes with guns and shit like that. But uh, thinking tactically, if you're going into a conflict and your opponent is dictating the rules of engagement, you're, you're not going to have much luck. Uh, going back to the fight uh, analogy, because I am a big, scary guy, what a lot of people don't know is I have post-concussion syndrome, and I'm like fragile as Glass Joe on the old video game, and I'd get a concussion if you look at me funny. But people are still scared of me because I'm a big dude, and I, I always say, so if you and I are going to go fight in an octagon, an MMA fight, would you rather make the rules? Or do you want me to make the rules? 
And, and uh, no one has ever said, oh, you go ahead and make the rules. Well, maybe a real MMA fighter would say that, but uh, letting your opponent make the rules is a really bad idea in any sort of situation. And so when we hate people who hate, we're playing by their rules. If we're ag aggressive to people who are aggressive, they are dictating how we are interacting with them. And rather than let that happen, these very brave people said, no, no, I'm making the rules here. And the rules are, this is how a human being treats another human being. And, and this is what awaits you if you can set aside all your bullshit and just not be terrified of the rest of the human beings on the, on the planet. And every time that happened, it drove home how wrong I was. And, and how this whole identity I had built up on, on the color of my skin and everything else was just like a house of cards that was that fragile that uh, just somebody walking by could make the whole thing come down. So to get to that point, people had to go through a process of forgiveness. These people knew I hated them. There, there was no mystery about that. I just saw the pictures. Like, I, I was... <laughs> I, I had swastikas tattooed on me and all over my jacket, shaved head, scars, tattoos. Like, you could not make that mistake. And so they dictated the rules of engagement, forgiveness, to get to a point of compassion where they see my suffering behind the swastika, and then to bring it home, kindness. And, and the, the bottom line is all of those things are acts of power. They are not acts of capitulation. I, I hear all the time, and uh, I'm very, whenever I'm ta speaking with party, this is a question I just shuffle off to him right away, and, and appropriately so, because he's a better person to answer this question than me, but since he's not, I'll answer it in case it's in anybody's mind here. I hear all the time, why is it oppressed people? Why is it people of color? Why is it Muslims? Why is it gay people? Why is it all, always the oppressed minority who has to be forgiving and kind? Uh, that's a, a very legitimate question. Um, the first answer is that it's not. If, if you go to the forgivenessproject.com where Pardeep and I are, are uh, very fortunate to be a part of it, and as are my friends Basam and Robbie, you'll see that that forgiveness goes all directions. There are many stories of white people forgiving black people. Uh, Israel and Palestine, all sides, types of stories of people on both sides of that conflict forgiving each other. Same with, with South Africa. Uh, a real amazing woman named Jim Forey, whose daughter was killed by ANC militants, and Jim's white, and she found the guy who ordered the attack and, and forgave him and said, I, I understand your struggle and but you know, she also said you know the 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 woman that you killed my daughter was uh an advocate for ending apartheid she was not your enemy yet you you killed her because they color her skin so that that forgiveness goes both ways and and when we get really wrapped up in pol politics we start convincing ourselves that oh no we're all we're the only ones who have to forget and then it's it's just not the case so that first and foremost that's that's a really important part of that answer. And second of all, what Pardeep says is he says to him, forgiveness is vengeance. It's not just power, it, it's vengeance. And, and what he means by that, and I can corroborate this as a former white nationalist, is the man who killed his father and ultimately six other people, there, there was one man in that attack, Baba Punjab Singh, who was mortally wounded and was in a vegetative state up until just this last February, and he finally passed away. Um, the man who committed that attack wanted to live in Pardeep's head forever. He wanted to take his time and energy and have it directed at him in the form of hatred and anger. Just like me, he wanted to cultivate hatred and anger in the world. And, and more specifically, cultivate separatism. Cultivate this idea that, yes, we are different because of the color of our skin. And, and no, we cannot connect with each other. Party denied him that. He's like, yeah, you're not getting that from me. My vengeance is I am withholding that from you because I am not wasting one bit of my time and energy that my four kids need and that my wife needs and my widowed mother needs and my community needs. You don't get any of that. That's all mine. And, and therefore, that's how forgiveness as vengeance works. 
So I, I'm a big advocate of seeing forgiveness, compassion, and kindness as, as not just power, but weapons. And they need to be our weapons of choice in this fight against the spiritual disease of racism and sexism and religious intolerance and homophobia and all these other isms that, that seem to make us think that we're d different and separate from each other. Uh, and, and very importantly, we, we have to see those, those sicknesses as our opponents and not the people who are stricken with them. Because if you would have seen me as and said that he's a racist, to hell with him, and, and you would have attached that to me and my being, that's what I wanted people to do. Again, you're playing by your opponent's rules. So when you say, no, no, you're a human being who's going through a rough time and you got mixed up and you're, you're, you're making some mistakes and, and you're not really seeing the world in a healthy way, uh, you have a disease and, and I want to help cure it. That is, is what is ultimately kryptonite to hate and, and all its manifestations. Well, that was, a, that was an amazing answer. I love I loved that last part of it. I think we saw, so it kind of like showed some, showed some about <laughs> not, trying to, not trying to label each other, but trying to understand that you know, there is an aspect of bias in all of us and we should really pre you know, reach out to these people and give our love. Um, I know we're running a little bit over than There's we said, so many questions. and there are so <laughs> many questions. Oh my God. I'm getting them all private. So, I thought we had an hour, bro. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I, well, my, my bad. Uh, <laughs> it got messy, but listen, we, we said now that workshops are going to start at three 30 and still finish at five. So okay. we'll, we'll keep to go this for 15 minutes, uh, with a couple more questions. Sure. I'm happy to. Uh, yeah. I'm awake now. Yeah. I'm getting back to sleep now. You might as well. <laughs> <laughs> we have a really nice one from Sven and Rosette, and I think they wanted to say it live because it was quite long, but I think it would be good to explain it. So if you guys are ready to jump in. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Um, Hi, Sven and Rosette. Um, so um, re with regards to what you said about um, the everyone being more alike than different and this sort of... Um, Sort of humanist outlook, if I might call it that. Sure. Um, so I have a bit of trouble with that in some ways. I think it's better than a lot of other things. That first off, um, but I still feel like this. Um, if if you're def defining everyone as human, then you'd still have to define something as human, and something in those people that is alike. And um, a big difficulty with that is first of all that there will always probably be people that fall outside that small uh, or even large definition. That's always the danger in just saying, oh, everyone is human, everyone is like me, and I'm like everyone. It's still this you-centric view that um, I am like everyone and everyone is like me. Mm. And um, I think, as I, as I wrote in the question, I think it would um, impair our ability to truly recognize when someone falls outside it, but um, also makes it more difficult to accept some form of absolute difference if it arises. Um, if we think everyone is alike, and then when someone is different, then we cannot recognize that. So it, um, I, I think that is a real shortcoming of this thinking that everyone is human, everyone is alike, because then it is, when someone has a problem that we fundamentally don't recognize, we mm. cannot accept it as a problem since it is not like us or human. Well, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think that's fantastic. I, I'm a Buddhist, so like this is all Dharma 101. You're thinking about like, you, you can't define self without talking about non-self elements. Like I can't define me if I don't say what's not me. So it, it's, uh, I, I see where you're going with that. And, and uh, it, it's a very valid point. I, I would, like, I'd answer by say, like, when I say we're all alike, I, I certainly don't mean like we're an ant colony. And, and that, that's a really incredibly important thing to think about. Um, in, in our current discourse, sadly, a lot of the efforts to um, undo racism are all based on race. So they're like thinking that you can somehow have race in society, but not have racism. 
I'm of the opinion that race is a product of racism. It, it wasn't like race was this neutral, objective thing that then racists came along and exploited. Race was created by racists in order to exploit groups of people. So yeah, I, I think you can't have one without the other. And um, the issue, all the issues that we're dealing with right now it are, are because for 500 years, race has, has been this idea that like because of the color of your skin, you're a monolithic group. You're all alike. All black people do this. All white people do this. All brown people, yellow people, red people, whatever. So it's it's the the branding of identity according to skin color, and then saying like these people with this skin color do this, and they're different from these people with this skin color who all do this. And uh, what your point brings up is that like we're not all like that. Um, there's with the Black Lives Matter movement, which I, I'm a, a supporter of for sure, and I think it needs to be said that Black Lives Matter because in the United States and many other parts of the world, they just don't matter to the degree that everyone else's lives do, and, and that's wrong, and we need to change that. But in this discourse, you hear a lot of people saying, like, listen to black voices. And I'm like, oh, all right, I'm listening. I'm, I'm listening to the ones who are uh, saying one particular political solution to this, and I'm listening to other ones who are saying, like, no, I don't really agree with that. And the... the to me, the bottom line is not really the merit of what one voice is saying or another voice is saying, but understanding that the most important diversity that we should all be aware of is diversity of thought. Because the diversity of thought is what drives home that black people are not a monolithic group that all think and act the same way. And nor are white people, nor are anybody else. We're, we are all individual human beings having a, a incredibly unique experience that no one else can have so in that respect you're right like we're we're not alike in all these ways it, as you could have like identical twins growing up in an identical environment and there's still going to be variations between them but when i say we have more in common than different i'm talking about like core human needs that we all share so if you guys are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you're the you get the pyramid, the bottom's the very base needs. You need food, water, shelter. As you go up the pyramid, the needs become more esoteric. And just using violent extremism, for example, violent extremism preys on the needs of identity, purpose, and belonging. If you don't have a healthy answer to those needs, here comes white nationalism, here comes uh, violent Islamism, here comes anti-fascism, here comes whatever, all, all sorts of violent extremist means of answering those needs. And those needs are something we all have. We all have a need for identity. And I, I think the most powerful common need that I, I think about all the time, I in the States, we had a guy named, uh, who had a kid show named Mr. Rogers. In a show called Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. I don't know how like known he is worldwide. Like Doth, you you know? Okay. So Yeah, the sweater, fun guy. Yeah, yeah, with the sweater, he'd take his shoes off, put them on every day. Um, there was a couple of docs out uh, on his name was Fred Rogers, and he was actually one of the most amazing human beings in, in our history. And he said all kinds of amazing stuff, but one of his quotes of mine that uh, your your question brought to mind is Mr. Rogers said everything that human beings do is either because of love or a lack of it and I think that is absolutely true and, and I, I think that all human beings have a, an innate need to experience love in our lives and when you don't you suffer and bad things happen. Uh, so in, in that sense, I, I would push back and say, yeah, we do have that, we all have that in common. And for me, my story that I, I'm relating to the world with is is very much driven by that. To, to first of all say, look, I, no matter how tough I claim to be and no matter how hard I claim to be, like I need to be loved just like everybody else. And, and I have to 
not be afraid of that vulnerability and, and express it. And, and the good news is when you just put it out there, you're like, hey, yeah, now, now you're, <laughs> you're actually invulnerable in a way. You, you become much stronger when you stop trying to hide your vulnerabilities. But uh, vulnerabilities are another common human thing. Um, no matter where you're from, who you are, how much you got, don't got, whatever, we, we all have those moments when we're afraid and, and when we're, we worry that we don't, we're not enough and we can't do this or can't do that. Like, those are all common human things. And so that, that's what I mean when I, when I say we, I believe we have more like and different. Thank you so much, Arno. I hope, Sven, if you thumbs up, if you think that was, a, if you're happy with the answer, you feel... Come on, you got a smile on his face. <laughs> uh, not really, to be honest. So, oh, no, yeah. okay. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, I like the answer, but um, then, so um, I, I believe that to uh, then again revert to this thing, I, I don't, I like, I don't disagree that um, people in general need love and uh, vulnerability and that stuff. So I think that's good. But to um, then say that those are fundamental human needs. Um, I think that is homogenizing again and to, to look at yourself and others and say, this is what is common in others. I think that is, uh, in all humans, I think that is again, uh, an imperialist sort of way of thinking to, to say that you also have this, uh, and that is what makes you a human like me. And I, I think that's, that, uh, can be still still there is a problem there i mean i think that's a very interesting dialogue that we could open up uh, <laughs> I, I just appreciate that people have been messaging me please for their question uh so i'm just going to do two together and we can leave it there from yana and emma because i think it's a really nice thing for people to take away um which essentially that we all have a story like arno talks about with the good and the bad aspect of it we all have traumas that we've been through and the first part of this is arno do you regret the past decisions you made or and would you change them and to follow on from that i guess it's you know with all of us with the fears we've had and you know how, how can we use our story how can we as a young group of young people start in the process of helping others who maybe we've seen bias in or hate in or how can we learn to be open to our own biases and move through our own prejudices that's a hard question to answer like do i regret like i i, I regret all the people that i hurt I, I regret all the harm that I've done, which which is immense. Like I can't even. I've been thinking about this harm since 1994, and I still can't get my head around the complete depth of it. And I know I'll never be able to. Uh, at the same time, I love who I am now, and I love what I do now, and I love the, my connections with you guys and with Party and with everything else. And and I'm very. Uh, my life's not far from perfect, but I, I, I just love the process of life. And that's like, that's how you win life as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, I, if I could do it all over again and still be who I am without hurting everybody, that would be great. But obviously that that's not possible. And, and I think that's, that speaks to like the relationships that we have with the past. Um, I think you need to have a, a level of acceptance of the past and understand that it, you, you're not able to change it. All you can do is process it and, and change the way that you look at it. Uh, Pardeep was the, the and I, I don't think he coined this, but he was the first person I heard talk about post-traumatic growth. The idea that, yeah, you, you have stress after trauma, but you also have the, the potential for growth and that growth can bring you somewhere that you never been before and, and it could be somewhere amazing so uh i i think that's all part of that answer and as far as uh what you guys can do and i i this is <laughs> this is like always what i feel like what can i do to uh stop white nationalism and stop hate in the world and, and i just say i don't know because that's the answer. The answer is I don't know. And and when I say I don't, I don't know, the answer is like create space for uncertainty in your story, the story that you're writing about the world. Um, so and if you're very certain that imperialist things are doing this or that, uh, maybe create some space for uncertainty and say, well, is it possible? 
is it possible that I, there's a different way to, to look at this particular issue than the way that I'm looking at it? And, and I need to do that as well. I, I'm not, I, I, I never would suggest things that, <laughs> that I don't do myself. So when we say I don't know, first of all, it's very liberating actually when you get in the practice of it. And um, uh, this is you guys' homework too. Go on YouTube and uh, find, search the song "I Don't Know" by the Beastie Boys. It's it's one of, it's like a really mellow acoustic song that Adam Yelp sang, and um, it's my song to come out of med meditation every day. And it's just one of the most simple, beautiful songs that there is. And the lyrics about just like kind of saying, "Hey, I I'm as mis I'm as confused as anybody else. I'm just trying to get through this. All I can do is keep going on." And, and to create space for uncertainty in your life, that is how, first of all, you're going to be able to cope in, in whatever challenge you're going through. And if, and if you're going out to change the world, that's a pretty big challenge. And uh, second of all, when you're interacting with someone who has like extreme certainty, and I'll guarantee you any white nationalist has going to be all kinds of certainties about this and that. And any political extremist is going to have all kinds of certainties about the world. If you can create space for them to have some uncertainty, that's when their their change and their enlightenment can begin. Um, and 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 maybe I just say like growth is 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 what, is what comes out of uncertainty. So uh, and and the good news is is we have a global pandemic going on. So there is uncertainty to burn for everybody to work with. Uh, and, and so we see this situation we're in now as, as an opportunity and become comfortable with that uncertainty, then uh, you're going to put yourself in a really good position to not only personally thrive, but to, to help make the world a healthier place as well. Yeah. I want to thank you so, so much. I'm still having questions for the end, but I, I really love at the end how you're saying create space for uncertainty. I think us as a collective group, we're all and we're all amazing and we all we have so many spiritual values and all the things that we've been taught about. And I think it's great if we all start to just question these things. And we talked about it earlier in the session. If if today you're gonna read a newspaper article and it agrees with what you're thinking, go maybe there's another perspective. And that mm -hmm. can be about anything. It can be Yeah, it's also tied into what Emma said yesterday about security being a myth. Yeah. You know, like we rely on this and then we with uncertainty, we always grow, right? So, yeah. yeah. There you go. So uh, I think you said it in UNESCO, which is last year, and I really like this, so I'm going to bring it up now. But like, a good way of doing this, everybody, is to read the. So if you like the left wing newspapers, just read a right wing newspaper for the time being, or right. if you, just just do it. Just try it out. See what happens. See what you think. If you just like a certain type of movie, just try and see another perspective about it. And I think. Be open to that and you might find some growth. I really love it. I, I always implore people, I, in the States we have the Democrats and Republicans and they're just always like this. And I know who I like, I know who I vote for. You probably take a wild guess, but <laughs> I, when, when people are when people are one time or one team or the other, and there's like, they're doing this and they're doing that, and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, I'm really not interested in, in you pointing out what's wrong with, with your opponents. I'm like, tell me what's wrong with your team. Tell me what you can, you can improve on. And for me, like, nothing. <laughs> That's your answer. I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> we don't have a lot to talk about because if you're perfect and there's nothing that your team could do better, then uh, there's not a lot of places to go from there. Again, create space for uncertainty. It, it's, it's the question your own team question your own beliefs like th the things that resound most with you are the things that should be most deeply questioned and and if those things are genuine they'll stand up to that question yeah. hey thank all you guys for the the work you're doing and for for your time and energy to to make this world a better place that's really important to me and i'm very grateful so thanks a lot and, uh,